whatever I'm doing in that moment, I really try to be completely focused and present on that moment and never thinking about the thing that comes next. And over time, I think I train myself to be able to do that. So, you know, if I get up in the morning and walk my daughter to the bus, she's more than old enough that she does not need me to walk her to the bus. She's maybe even a little embarrassed by it. But I have this theory that if you're there as a parent, sometimes in the middle of the routine, like a meaningful moment will happen. And it might not happen most days when it's, you know, seven in the morning, we're bleary eyed and neither of us is in the greatest mood. But if we're both there, you know, one out of 10 days, or even if it's one out of 100 days, something will happen. And I really try to just be present for that. If I sit down in front of my computer and say, okay, I'm going to write a column now, I literally shut out everything except for that column. And I turn on my voice recognition software because I do everything by voice recognition software. And I just focus completely. And I've trained myself to just put myself into flow. And I do it. I don't worry about whether it's good or it's bad. I just get it out there. I'll worry about whether it's good or it's bad when I'm done with it. And then it's done. And then I stop, take a deep breath, read it over. I hit send to my editor. Thank God I have an editor so that I'm not reliant on myself to know whether it was any good or not. An editor will tell you this one was terrible, throw this one out. But I send it to the editor and I put it out of my mind completely. It's gone. And then I do the next thing. And by doing it that way, I think I'm just saving the time waste that we have in a kind of self-questioning that inevitably sinks in the rest of the time. Now, you might say what's missing from this is self-reflection. And honestly, I think for many years of my life, that's true. I think for many years of my life, I was missing genuine self-reflection. Like I had, I had fake self-reflection where I had conversations and thought about things, but I wasn't really, really, really doing it. And it wasn't until my late 30s when um, I went to see a shrink for the first time because I was having a, you know, a kind of little early, you know, early midlife meltdown that I actually engaged in that kind of self-reflection and I did not know how to do it. I really didn't know how to do it. And I would say to myself after therapy, oh my God, I'm failing at therapy. Like I know I just wasted that whole session. And I kept on saying that for a long time. What do you mean by failed? <laughs> what does failing look like? How, how, how does one fail at that? Well, I guess the reason I thought I was failing is I was mistakenly thinking that therapy was like every other thing that I do. You know, a concentrated 45-minute session where you're supposed to accomplish something. And I would go in, and on the way out, I was like, I didn't accomplish anything. I don't feel better. I don't feel worse. I didn't have any deep self-revelation. Like, what the hell did I do? You know, I was, and in the sense that I was only doing it wrong because I thought I was doing it wrong. Like, you can't do therapy wrong, but I thought that there was a way to do it right, and therefore there must be a way that I wasn't doing it, and also I wasn't getting any better, so then I thought, okay, you know, I really am doing it wrong. And then over time, it took a long time, I came to realize that just sitting there and being in the moment and letting it happen and not saying, okay, I'm going to go in to achieve this and I'm going to leave having achieved that was the only way therapy was ever going to do anything. And I wish I could tell you that like I thought of that quickly, but I didn't. So for sake of clarity, you ended up viewing therapy as a, almost a meditative time for non-accomplishment through which you found it therapeutically valuable? Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, I think it's that, I, I don't know about meditative, because you are talking, you know, some right. of the time. And depending on who your therapist is, the therapist might also be talking. <laughs> some don't like to say very much. But I think what I realized was that you have to just let things bubble up. You can't force it. You cannot force your way into having successful talk therapy. And that was the, the takeaway for me. And I know most people listening to this are like, uh, duh, like you have to be pretty dumb not to have realized that, like it says it on the bottle, you know, but I, I was that kind of dumb. And I think it derived from, you know, having this approach to everything else where I thought, okay, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to be doing here? I'm going to totally do it. And I'm going to do it in a total concentrated way. And I'm going to know at the end of it that I accomplished it so that I can move on to the next thing. 